Hello, and welcome to the OrthoClips podcast series. I'm Saka Brahman, and today I'm with Dr. Robert O'Toole. Uh, he is the Hans-Jörg Weiss Medical Foundation Endowed Professor in Orthopedic Trauma at the University of Maryland Medical System and Division Head of Orthopedic Traumatology and Chief of Orthopedics at the R. Adams Cowley Shock Trauma Center and also Fellowship Director of the Orthotrauma Fellowship Program. Uh, welcome, Dr. O'Toole. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me on here. So today we're going to talk about aspirin versus Lovenox for orthotrauma patients. And uh, this was a, uh, I'll let you give the details, but this was just published in New England Journal. So getting a lot of uh, exposure and uh, as, it, as it should be. So can you summarize what this study is about? Yeah, absolutely. So this study was a randomized trial looking at Lovenox versus aspirin in orthopedic trauma patients who had an operative fracture, the upper or lower extremities or a pelvis fracture, asked to have them whether or not it was operated on. It's a big study at 21 centers enrolled over 12,000 patients. The primary outcome measure was death from any cause. And uh, it was a non-inferiority trial. So we were trying to investigate whether or not aspirin was non-inferior to low molecular weight heparin in all-cause mortality. And what the study showed was that indeed it was non-inferior, essentially there's the same number of deaths in both groups, in the aspirin group and the Lovenox group. And it also had very similar findings in our other outcomes. So there's no difference in pulmonary embolism, no difference in death from PE, no difference in bleeding, no difference in wound problems, no difference from infe in infection. The only difference between the two uh, arms was observed in deep vein thromboses. And so there was an advantage in the Lovenox arm for DVT. However, if you dig into that a little bit more, there's two comments to make on that. One is there was no difference in DVTs above the knee. It was all distal DVT, which as you know, are thought to be a clinically less important. And the absolute size of the difference was below 1%. It's a very large study. So of course you, you're powered to see little differences. Um, and so, you know, clinicians should be you know aware of that. There is a difference there. Uh, how clinically important that is, that's for each person to make their own determination. Okay, um, that's a great summary. And and can you tell me what response you're getting from your colleagues, um, you know, now that this is out there, and I'm sure there was a lot of discussion while it was happening, but, you know, ortho trauma community, what about your general surgery colleagues, other people who, uh, you know, the other um, stakeholders, I guess. Yeah, I think the response by and large has been very positive. Uh, it's also there's certainly been a lot of interest in the study. So uh, the New England Journal of Medicine has a tracking function about how often things are looked at. And so the page, uh, the story, the article has been viewed 45,000 times already, which is in the top 2% or something of the statistics they keep. And there's a ton of social media action on it. So it, it's definitely something that's of great interest to the broader medical community. So people are definitely, it's getting out there. So people know about it. I definitely had, you know, anecdotally, I had people come up to me after we presented at ODA and say, oh, hey, you know, you know tell me more because we want to change our policy. But obviously there could be lots of people who, you know, have criticisms that we don't know about yet. I think the main question people have is, is does this apply to really high risk patients? You know, so the subgroup of patients that have, pick whatever the risk factor is you want, acetabular surgery, obesity, you know, whatever. And uh, we, those studies aren't finalized yet, but we, we have looked into that uh, some, and there's some OTA submissions uh, that are going in about that as secondary analyses. So I don't want to steal the thunder of that, but we don't see any concerning signal. We just leave it at that. Yeah, you know, for instance, um, uh, you have a patient who has, um, you know, uh, other injuries for which the general surgery team would otherwise be using low molecular weight heparin, right? And there is a fracture that uh, otherwise needs to be treated with prophylaxis. But I mean, that that's that's an example I could see certain pointed out to me. Like, look, I mean, you're you're taking a patient that we haven't been treating with aspirin. Those patients we treat with low molecular weight heparin when they're hospitalized patients in the ICU, et cetera. Um, so. Have you so you know? Have you found any pushback at all? Um, like you mentioned, the high risk patients, but uh, there's there's so many scenarios where you could have a patient that otherwise is you know being treated with low molecular weight heparin. Yeah, but that's exactly what this study was about, right? So this study took all comers. This had very broad inclusion criteria, 
um, ICU patients. If you look at look at who's in here, we have lots. Of, there's a risk score for VTE, so for venous thromboembolism, embolism, and we have lots of patients with very high risk of getting blood clots. And they were in this study. So this this study is certainly not a study uh, where at these 21 trauma centers we picked off. Uh, just the low risk patients and gave them aspirin. That's not correct at all. A large portion of these patients had bad injuries and that's who's in this study. So it's very pragmatic. It's, you know, we just enrolled all the trauma patients. The only special thing about them was that they had fractures. Now to me, one of the questions is then, well, okay, well, let's say you buy it for the fractures and you say, well, now what do I do with that for the non-fractured patients? And so you know, those, those patients are in here. So it's a little hard to argue why, if it, if it is reasonable for patients with fractures, why if you remove the fracture, which is thought to increase the risk of VTE, that this would be not a good idea to do. So, you know, we don't have a study on patients without fractures, but of course, all those patients are, you know, those patients with belly injuries and head injuries and the ICU, they're all in this study. It's just, they all also have fractures. Yeah, it's a good, that's a really good question, potentially another study. Um, if anything, I've seen um, a little bit of a push towards saying, hey, we're not adequately dosing our patients with low molecular weight heparin. And you have you know, patients that you give standard dosing to that uh, perhaps should have you know, like a weight-based dosing, not to, uh, not to treatment, but a prophylactic weight-based weight dosing. So um, and I think I'm seeing some of that already now happening. So uh, it makes the case a little bit harder, uh, you know, in the absence of, you know, data like this. But is that something you've seen uh, also or, you know, moving towards weight-based versus fixed dose low molecular weight heparin? Yeah, I think that's an interesting comment. So, the, you know, there are some recommendations and some discussions about whether or not you should be checking blood levels to dose your Lovenox. And the comment I would make on that is, is multiple. So the first is when this study came out, our hematology colleagues looked at when they heard someone say this, well, you know, maybe the Lovenox dose wasn't right. And the comment was, well, how much lower could the event rate possibly get? I mean, look how low the event rate is in both arms already. So you've taken this high-risk population and driven the events down very low. Is it even possible to get lower than this? So it's not like we're seeing overall what we think is bad performance you could you know argue any event is bad but you're not going to get this to zero right like no one thinks you can get it that low the second comment is the data upon which those ideas are based they are not 12,000 person randomized trials right these are small much smaller studies that have you know of course risk of bias that is much more significant than a prospective randomized trial and so uh, I just think it's important that people realize and they sort of back up and look at that because we've, we've sort of, you know, we had a big town hall here where we went through these data. And I'm not saying they're bad data, they're not bad data, but they're, it's, I think it's a little, it's, they're not, to me, as convincing uh, that the clinical effect uh, is as, as obvious of weight-based dosing of this. I don't, I'm not opposed to it, but, you know, checking levels and stuff is expensive, right? So, if, you know, if you're going to start implementing that, uh, that's that's really something you want to make sure that that really is going to benefit the patients clinically. Got it. Good points. Um, I'm going to back up just a little bit and ask you to tell us a little bit more about metric. This was a metric study, metric consortium, and uh, kind of how this study came to fruition. Um, if you you know there's a story or something you want to anecdote or something you want to tell us about how this study came about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me start with, with what is metric and then how did the study come about? So, so what is metric? So metrics started in 2009. It was sort of the brainchild of Mike Bossy at Carolinas and Ellen McKenzie at Hopkins. And they had been the people who did LEAP and led that uh, study. And they brought this consortium together, which has now grown to 80 plus centers. And metric has grown um, enormously since that time. There have been over 30 studies that metric has either started or completed. And has uh, won grants of you know $150 million or so, and so been very successful in doing these high quality studies. And so this is one of those studies. And um, how it works is, you know, so the University of Maryland were the PI site for it, but this never could happen without without metric and the coordinating center at Johns Hopkins, under now the direction of Ron Castillo and a big team there that uh, coordinates all these sites and all these studies and helps us win the grant and helps us do everything. And so metric has really 
amplified the ability of clinicians, real world clinicians out in the field to partner with researchers and do high quality research that we never could do on our own, just, just wouldn't be possible. So I think metric, uh, the vision that, that Mike and Alan had has really, this study is sort of shows it coming to fruition, you know, and, and many other studies that metric has helped lead. So I think it's, uh, it's a good example of, of, you know, why you need something like metric and why uh, funding for metric is so important. The other comment in terms of how like the study came about is actually the study came about by a guy named Ted Manson, who's joints and um, a trauma train, you may know, who was here at Trauma for years, and Deb Stein, who's the co-PI on this, she's a trauma surgeon. So they sort of had discussions about this, because as you know, in arthroplasty, aspirin is very accepted as DVT prophylaxis. And so, you know, Ted and Deb used to go back and forth about this, and uh, eventually we said, hey, let's, let's, let's settle it, let's figure it out. And so we started doing pilot work at shock trauma, over a decade ago, and uh, we ran a study like Prevent Clot at Shock Trauma with feasibility, and we just did it there first, and then eventually got the Bocori grant of uh, almost 12 million bucks to, to run this out. And also, although you know it only took us a little four years to enroll these 12,000 patients, you know, the whole process has been about a decade since when we first started it. Okay, yeah, great insight for those who uh, aren't involved in uh, big clinical trials, just, just peek behind the curtains. Um, well, to wrap up, what future directions do you think uh, we're going to take with this data? I mean, I'm just, I'll just point blank ask. I mean, does this shut the door on Lovenox as a preferred agent for prophylaxis? Yeah, I mean, now, now you're asking my personal opinion. I mean, the, the, the data show they both work well, you know, so if they were the same cost or patients didn't care, I think you could say either one is fine. And perhaps, I don't know, maybe that's what the guidelines will say is, you know, you could pick either. There's studies um, that have been done that show that patients strongly prefer a pill over a shot. As you know, you know, when you see patients in clinic, there's several things they consistently ask about besides oxycodone is when can I stop taking these shots? And so patients don't want to take the shots. And of course, if it's going to give them a mortality benefit, they'll take the shots. But if it's not really helping them much, they don't want it. And so for me, I think these are pretty strong data that it's reasonable to switch to aspirin as your routine prophylaxis in patients. I think that where we're going in the future is that, again, we'll need to really address in a, a strong way, which I think we'll be able to do with secondary analyses that, hey, does this really apply to the most at-risk patients? Is there a heterogeneity treatment effect here? Meaning, are there, you know, it, it works really well in low risk, but it doesn't work well in high risk. And Again, I don't want to cat out of the bag, but we've looked at that many different ways and we don't see any signals yet uh, that there's there's concern. But you know, we need to get that in public and have it peer reviewed and have people poke holes at it and see if we can convince people. Great. Well, really interesting stuff, really important stuff. And uh, I think a lot of our listeners will be interested. Obviously, uh, this is out there. Uh, you can just go to New England Journal uh, of Medicine and it's in, I believe, the January 19th issue yep. with the lead article. So congratulations uh, to you, uh, Dr. O'Toole and uh, Metric for, uh, for this important uh, uh, study. And I, I really thank you for coming on the show. It was uh, really good insight. Um, and everyone, I've been uh, talking with uh, Dr. Robert O'Toole uh, from the University of Maryland Shock Trauma. Dr. O'Toole, thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me on.